Tonight, the FCC considers regulating internet TV like cable TV. The FTC sues AT&T over data throttling. And Walmart responds to the whole Apple Pay war. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 203 for Tuesday, October 28th, 2014. This episode is brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create your own professional website or online portfolio. For a free two-week trial and 10% off, go to squarespace.com and use the offer code TECHNIGHTS. Oh, hello, everyone. I'm Sarah Lane, and let's get right into today's tech feed. The U.S. Federal Communications Commission, or FCC, is set to vote in the coming weeks on whether Internet TV should have the same access to television programming as cable and satellite TV providers. FCC Chairman Tom Wheeler announced today that he's asked his fellow commissioners to vote on the proposal that would help Internet TV services from companies like Dish Network and Sony and Verizon compete with traditional pay TV for digital rights to network programming. Now, online subscription video services that offer scheduled programming that's similar to traditional pay TV providers does not include online video services like Netflix, those stream content on demand. Now, until now, the FCC has allowed cable and satellite TV providers to negotiate for rights to retransmit uh, programming that originally comes from a network. But online video services rely on different technology and don't have their own video distribution facilities, so they've lacked the same regulatory backing, at least until now. The vote by four FCC commissioners would formally propose the idea and begin the process of seeking public comments which could include you. On stage at Recode's Code Mobile Conference today, YouTube CEO Susan Wojcicki said that the company is in the early stages of exploring new subscription services and suggested that one option could be an ad-free service. In fact, she compared the idea to apps where users can either choose ads or pay a fee. She says it's an interesting model and that the company is thinking about how to give those users options. Google, of course, is uh, Google owns YouTube. <laughs> YouTube does not own Google. Uh, and YouTube attracts more than, or Google rather, attracts more than a billion visitors per month. Mobile visits are on the rise, and that goes for YouTube as well. Wachiki shared that 50% of YouTube views are now also coming from mobile devices. She also said that the site is growing 50% each year in terms of watch time. Google doesn't actually break out YouTube's financials separate from the company as a whole, but eMarketer has said that the site generated $5.6 billion in ad revenue last year. But it's not just YouTube looking to offer new subscriptions. Vimeo CEO Kerry Trainer also tells Recode that, quote, we're working on it. The shovels are in the ground. Trainer says the Vimeo video service, which is owned by IAC, won't start selling subscriptions until next year. And he also didn't offer details about timing or pricing or, or even content of those subscriptions. Trainer does note, though, that Vimeo has actually been selling subscriptions for six years, sells premium versions of its pre-service to more than 500,000 users who pay for things like extra storage and better publishing tools. In fact, I'm one of those people. And for the last year and a half, Vimeo has also been selling content by letting some video makers sell and rent their creations on the site. So they're kind of got one shovel in the ground already. The Federal Trade Commission is suing AT&T because the U.S. carrier throttles speeds of its unlimited data customers. Are you one of them? I am. It's a policy that the FTC describes as deceptive and unfair. In a press release today, the FTC said AT&T, quote, misled millions of its smartphone customers by slowing down their data speeds after they used up a certain amount of data in a single month and didn't make its throttling policies clear enough. It's sort of key there. Now, AT&T doesn't actually offer unlimited data plans anymore, but for those who are grandfathered in, the carrier began slowing speeds for heavy users back in 2011, and 3.5 million unique customers have had speeds slowed more than 25 million times since then. That's according to the FCC. In a statement, AT&T said in response... Quote, it's baffling as to why the FTC would choose to take this action against a company that, like all major wireless providers, manages its network resources to provide the best possible service to all customers and does it in a way that's fully transparent and consistent with the law and our contracts. One might ask then why Verizon is not throttling its unlimited customers the same way. 
Google announced Google Fit back in June. Remember, it's a platform to help people track their fitness goals via a set of APIs that let developers connect with other apps and microphones and combine data for deeper insights. Very similar to Apple Health. Well, today, Google launched a dedicated Google Fit app for Android, which captures your movements throughout the day. Users can also set goals based on duration or steps and see how they progress. And Google Fit offers recommendations based on performance. Confirmed launch partners include Nike, HTC, LG, RunKeeper, YThings, Motorola, Noom, Runtastic, and Polar which offers a variety of apps and devices to centralize all data within Google Fit. Boy, we all better be like bodybuilders this time next year. This is all going to seem really silly. Verizon's got a new phone to offer you, bodybuilders and other people. The Droid Turbo by Motorola with a 5.2-inch Quad HD AMOLED display, a Kevlar back, and up to 48 hours of power and a quick charge feature that nets up to eight hours of use from a 15-minute charge. Of course, there's a proprietary cable involved with that. The Droid Turbo also sports a Snapdragon 805 processor with 2.7 gigahertz quad-core CPU, 3 gigabytes of RAM, and a 21-megapixel rear cam. The phone will be available October 30th and starts at $199 with a two-year contract and increases to $249 with extra storage. On to Facebook earnings. It's good and it's bad, depending on who you ask. The company's third quarter numbers revealed $3.203 billion in revenue and $1.35 billion monthly users, which is slower than its 3.125% user growth in the second quarter of this year, previous quarter. On the daily user side, Facebook reported 864 million daily users and 703 million mobile daily users. That's a pretty big number of total million daily users. The company now has 456 million mobile only users, users who only access Facebook via mobile, and that's up 14.2% from the 399 million last quarter to make up about a third of Facebook's entire user base. Now, although earnings beat Wall Street's estimates and the company has about $14.25 billion in cash for things like new products and acquisitions, the stock was nearing a 10% drop in after hours trading following these numbers. Speaking of numbers, what about WhatsApp? You know, the messaging company that Facebook bought for $22 billion in cash and stock. In 2014, WhatsApp lost $140 million and generated $10 million in revenue. Hmm, those numbers don't really add up. The app offers a $1 per year subscription plan, but has said in the past, at least, that it doesn't have any intentions of adding ads. Yeah, hmm. Coming up, meet the customer service robot who's going to help you out at the hardware store. And up next, I will chat with Donna Tam from CNET about the ongoing saga between Apple Pay and currency. Yes, there is more. <laughs> but first, let's take a moment to thank Squarespace for sponsoring this episode of TN2. It's the all-in-one platform that makes it fun and easy and a way to look extremely professional online with a website or an online portfolio. You're going to love Squarespace because the designs are really nice. I've mentioned this before. It, 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 the number one kind of fun thing to do when you go to Squarespace is just look through their 25 templates that they've set up for you and get a sense of the different kinds of websites and layouts and color schemes and, and just overall looks you can start with and then customize from there if you want to or, or, or really don't do any customizing at all besides whatever you want to add to the site. A logo creator tool is also great for, for, for professionals, small businesses. It's easy to use. Squarespace also has live chat and email support all day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If, you're, if you run into issues or you've got questions, e-commerce functionality is nice. All subscription plan levels get this. You can accept donations. So it's great if you're a nonprofit, you're raising money for something, or any sort of a reason. That's all built-in functionality. And plans start at just $8 a month. That not only includes a free domain name if you sign up for a year, but it also includes hosting. So it's that all-in-one monthly fee that makes a lot of sense. Squarespace has two great apps. The Metric app for iPhone and iPad uh, allows you to keep uh, track of your site stats, your page views, that sort of thing. The blogging app, it's, it's exactly what it sounds like. You can make text updates. You can add images, change things around, move your layouts, and, of course, monitor activity and comments. 
Again, hosting is included. Squarespace does it all, so you don't have to. You can start a free two-week trial, no credit card required, free, 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 and start building your website. Have fun for two weeks. See what you can create. When you sign up for Squarespace, make sure to use the offer code TECHNIGHT, T-E-C-H-N-I-G-H-T, and get 10% off. And of course, that helps them know that you support us. And of course you support us. We thank Squarespace for their support. We thank you, you for your support of Tech News Tonight. A better web awaits. And it starts with your new Squarespace website. Joining us now is Donna Tam, staff writer over at CNET. Hello, Donna. Welcome back to the show. Hey. All right. So I know that you cover mobile payments, uh, among other things, for CNET. And actually, yesterday, we had an interesting um, perspective uh, from uh, from Australia uh, as to how you know some of the rest of the world is uh, is seeing this idea of Apple Pay and NFC and and, and some companies deciding that they don't want to play along. So at this point yesterday, we knew that Walmart and a consortium of other companies were not in favor of Apple Pay and were actually disabling NFC in some of their stores, CVS stores, uh, for example, Rite Aid stores, um, right. in favor of their own proprietary technology that they're getting ready for. What has Walmart said today in response to some of the backlash really against this? So, I mean, Walmart's um, statement is, is similar to like uh, Right Aid's statement was just they're waiting and seeing what happens in the mobile payment space um, and they still haven't decided what they want to support. Um, and so they haven't really, you know, they haven't really said anything specifically on um, Apple Pay specifically in terms of turning off NFC to stop it. That's something they're kind of avoiding, but they made it very clear that they're still trying to figure out what mobile payment is going to be the most widely accepted by consumers. And that's what they are waiting on. You know, when, when some mobile payment options have presented themselves, you know, I was a, I was a very enthusiastic square wallet uh, person for a while and which is not no longer being supported, but actually is still right. being used by some merchants. But that's I cool. know that I went out of my way to try to give those companies business because I believed in the technology. Apple says that in three days, Apple pay got activated on over 1 million cards. So that's that that certainly proves that there's a big interest for the for the for the retail chains that have at least for now said, yeah, we're not going to play nice with Apple Pay. How much do you think that it affects them? Because it really comes down to, you know, it, 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 does a backlash mean that people will stop buying things in your stores? And how much does that matter? So you have to imagine, like, you know, I think I think. One one person compared it to, to me. Uh, they explained it like how American Express used to never be accepted everywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, like you would have to be like. So when you went to the store, what did you do? You opted. You're like, well, you don't take my American Express if I don't have an, op an alternative alternative credit card. I'm not going to use it there, right? I have to go somewhere else. So it's kind of the same idea. I mean, the opposite's happening now. But um, you know, with American Express, it's being accepted more widely. But like, I think. That's what retailers have. To, they're taking a risk on that, right? Whether or not that's going to happen, um, and that still remains to be seen. I mean, yeah, that's a lot of activations, but um, who knows? You know, like if, if consumers are are seeing it more as like this is a really cool thing. Like I'm activating to try it out, but not necessarily like if I go to Rite Aid and they don't have it, I'm totally not going back there. Like I don't know if it's really that dire yet. Apple CEO Tim Cook is uh, was uh, on. Uh on stage at not the Recode conference, but Wall Street Journal's uh, concurrent conference. They're, they're doing the conference <laughs> the same week, turns right. out. Uh, it's interesting. Um, he has said that Apple Pay is already the leader in contact list payments. Um, obviously, the numbers, again, like I said, show extreme interest, at least with Apple users. Right. Has he responded to this currency issue? Um, the idea that the company's saying, well, we've, we've already got our own situation, uh, so Apple, you know, just isn't going to be able to play with, with, with anybody who visits our stores and wants to buy something. Yeah, I mean, he's basically said it's a kind of a, he's downplayed it a lot. He's like, it's kind of a small, you know, thing. And um, sometimes merchants will have different objectives from us. Um, but he thinks over time, you know, it's only going to work out for retailers if, you um, it's only going to work out retailers if, if the, the payment product that consumers use is, is what's in line with them. And he thinks, you know, he's, he's thinking that it will be Apple Pay. So um, he's basically saying it's not a big deal for them that this happened. Now, there was also talk that Jack Ma, who runs Alibaba, um, is very interested in a possible Apple partnership. Now, they've got uh, Alibaba has something called Alipay. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if you're reading the tea leaves, what kind of partnership are we thinking? Yeah, that's really curious because, I mean, he was also asked in that same, during that same time was like, 
you know, would you partner with someone like um, PayPal, which essentially that's what Alipay is known as, is the PayPal of China. Mm -hmm. And he said, no, I have my Alipay. Like he, or he said it, he kind of hinted, like, I have my Alipay. I'm good with that. So he expressed interest in Apple Pay, but not in PayPal, which is interesting because the, he, they're an e-commerce um, site. So the only things they can really use with Apple Pay right now is some of the maybe in-app purchases or things like that. Um, things that they already use Alipay for. So it's really curious why he's, he decided to say that. He was very, you know, he wasn't, he wouldn't go into further about it. Um, and he's been pretty tight-lipped about what they even plan to do in the U.S. But most likely if they do do something with Apple, I would expect it would be in China first because that's where they're comfortable. Um, so that's where they built their big business and they still haven't quite figured out how to do that in the U.S. yet. And Tim Cook, I know, has expressed interest not, not only in the Chinese market for for hardware sales and iPhones and, and, and everything, but that Apple Pay um, is really China is a huge key future market for something like Apple Pay. One would think if the terms were 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 clear and fair yeah. and everybody agreed on them that that would be a great um foothold that apple could just kind of jump off uh, onto into that totally. market as well yeah a ton of consumers there mm -hmm. donna tams a staff writer at cnet thanks so much donna for coming back on to tn2 and talking with us a little bit more and before you go let folks know where they can keep up with you yeah just go to uh cnet.com slash news donna y tam on twitter as well thanks donna yep Thanks, Sarah. All right, moving on. So Orchard Supply Hardware, which is a home repairs chain, it's actually a subsidiary of Lowe's, is going to start using robots to perform some basic customer service, at least at the store in San Jose, California, during this holiday season. Okay, so you might wonder, what does a robot help me with at a hardware store? If you're anything like me, you get very overwhelmed at hardware stores, and I don't really understand things like you know, screwdrivers and bolts. The robots will sport image recognition and 3D sensing to identify these types of objects for people like me that you place in front of them. Plus things like uh, bilingual speech capabilities to help the robots do the jobs that normally we need humans for. Kyle Nell, who's the executive director of Lowe's Innovation Labs, says that, quote, using science fiction prototyping, we explored solutions to improve customer experiences by helping customers quickly find the products and information that they came in looking for. As a result, we developed autonomous retail service robot technology to be an intuitive tool customers can use to ask for help in their preferred language and expect a consistent experience. Aha, consistency. I would like to see that. At least probably a stream of very curious customers this holiday season who might end up buying a rake, even if the robots are lame, because you're already in the store, right? Well played, Orchards. And that is it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. Hope you had a good time. Subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. I help support us as well. You can write us at TN2 at twit.tv with questions, comments, or feedback. And of course, Tech News Today, our morning news program, airs tomorrow live and every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. Don't miss it. For me, I'm Sarah Lane, and I'll see you tomorrow. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Cashfly.com.